without noting that it's 7.02 p.m. on November 3rd, 2021, I will call the Board of Health meeting to order, but since we are doing this virtually, we need to have a roll call vote in order to start the meeting and then I'll go into the agenda items after that. So, uh, Daryl Beardsley, aye, or present. Matt Beavers, present. Lisa Camp, present. Rebecca Honeywell, present. Matt Vitale, present. Okay, and then uh, we have a scheduled discussion, and then we have a number of other items and various people here who are interested in some of those topics. So we'll do that in a moment, but want to announce any items to be added to the agenda that were not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance of the meeting, and then we can vote whether to amend the agenda. I have just one, and that has to do with a new grant program. Ellen, sorry, what's the formal name of that that you mentioned? Shared service excellence, something like that? Yeah, public health excellence for shared services grant. Okay. The synergy and, sounds compelling. Okay. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have anything else to add? And if not, do we have a motion to add that one item to the agenda? So moved. Second. Any other comments? Daryl, aye. Matt Beavers, aye. Lisa, aye. Rebecca Honeywell, aye. Matt Vitale, aye. Okay. So we can go on to, I think COVID-19 would be reasonable because we yep. have K. Peterson here from Dover. Yep, and so um, uh, I just wanna kind of give some updates and uh, kind of propose a strategy for next steps. Um, for folks who are on the line who don't get the kind of weekly data push in terms of the, the COVID numbers, we locally track both the Sherburne and Dover rates of COVID infection as well as test positivity rate. We also do a sort of combination of Dover and Sherburne as though it were a single community for matters related to the district since there's mixing of the school population at the region. Um, and so as part of that, have had continued discussion uh, with the district and in the broader context of thinking about what kind of a masking off ramp may look like for those subsets of students that are eligible for the state um, per the state. So the state's current requirement, which they've now extended into 2022, is that schools that uh, have less than 80% vaccination rate for the school community are required to remain masked and there's no local control. Schools that exceed 80% within a given school may communicate that threshold, kind of meeting that threshold to the state and then um, control reverts to the local community to then decide next steps. So we haven't seen the most recently updated data from the district. Um, anecdotally, it sounds like there's been continued vaccination for the high school for some kids who'd gotten dose one but hadn't yet gotten dose two when they compiled the initial data. Um, and so the, at the high school level, we're somewhere in the 88 to 90% range is the best guess. And um, you know, thinking a little bit about how to balance a desire to minimize risk, what uh, desire to, you know, kind of say that COVID is unlikely to leave our community entirely and sort of thinking about what that might look like and, and what strategies might be prudent. Um, we're going to discuss that in detail with the Dover boards, but one of the things that came up in talking to the district was a general desire uh, to have concordance between the schools and other municipal buildings so that if we're saying the schools have met this threshold, thinking about that for other municipal buildings, and then a general desire to the degree possible to have concordance between the two towns. So uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of briefly give some food for thought in terms of thinking about a measure or a strategy that might be a reasonable off-ramp, and then to propose that we expand the agenda to, from the, for the special meeting next Wednesday from school masking to also include other municipal buildings. Um, so let me pause there and see if Kay or Matt have anything to add, and then I can talk a little bit about the measures I might recommend. 
And Lisa, I see you off me too. Welcome to weigh in too. No, I was just going to say, um, I agree with you about adding that to the agenda. Is that something we need to like um, make a motion and approve though, or no? Uh, so I think we can, uh, I think we can make a, a motion and approve adding it to the agenda. I think the goal would be to, to kind of take the action jointly with the Dover board in terms of agreeing on these are the thresholds on the meeting on the 10th. So I think stuff today is kind of food for thought or things to think about, but yep. the substantive discussion would then happen on the 10th. Um, right. So I, I'm, I'm just saying, I don't know, and this might be a question for Ellen. Um, if we want to expand beyond schools, is that something that we need to formally articulate now to add to the agenda, or we can just create the agenda in advance and include it? No, you, you don't need to do that right now. As okay. long as I have it by the time it needs to be posted, which the Monday be morning. Monday. Yeah. Okay, right. perfect. Okay, that was my that was my only question, Matt. Perfect. Um, and so uh, for the one of the questions that's come up is that there's sort of two ways that the data is report, reported out. And some of this is just an artifact of how the data was initially reported and what systems we built at the start of the last school year. And so the composite numbers are report for Dover and Sherburne combined. Look at the reported case count at two points two weeks apart and assigns the difference between those counts is the number of new cases over our population. The state has more granular individual level data, which we don't have easy access to. And so those counts may be slightly different. They're generally very close, but they won't be exactly the same most of the time. They'll be sort of plus or minus one or two cases per 100,000 um, per day typically. And so in the weekly reporting, we report out both the combined Dover Sherburne based on case counts, as well as the individual community level data for Dover and Sherburne. And the recommendation that I would have is when we sort of put the municipal mask mandate on, part of what we talked about was the um, CDC's substantial transmission, which includes two parts. One is a case rate uh, exceeding seven per 100,000 per day when you sort of average it out. They describe it in a cases per week, so it's a slightly different number. Um, and a positivity rate. In general, our positivity rate has always tracked closely with our incidence rate or number of new cases. And so I'd recommend that we just use one measure to avoid confusion. And I would recommend that if we see two weeks, two consecutive weeks of case rates below seven, which is essentially the threshold to go from substantial transmission where CDC recommends universal masking, even for those who are vaccinated, to moderate where that recommendation is no longer in play, um, that we then would use that to lift the mask mandate. I think that there are specific considerations that we should discuss in more detail next week about sort of what does an on-ramp look like. So one example might be for a school-based population, if we saw evidence of transmission in a school, even if we had um, low community level case rates, I'd recommend uh, going back to a period of masking to minimize the risk of further in-school transmission until that sort of process has played itself out. That's not something we've commonly seen. So my hope is that we won't see that come up. But again, I think being clear and communicating sort of what makes us feel like liberalizing um, mitigation strategies is reasonable, while also acknowledging there may be things that, that need kind of lead us to need to reconsider. Although my hope is that those won't arise. So with that, let me kind of pause. Oh, go ahead, Kay, I see your hand up. I see your hand up, but you're still muted. Or I see your hand gone, but you're muted. Here. Can you hear me now? Yep. OK, good. I, I would amplify what you said uh, or expand on it a little bit by, by saying that I think we need to make it clear that there has to be some wiggle room in here, that we are not um, locking ourselves into a number uh, no matter what's happening in the community. And I, I, I think your example of an outbreak in the school being something that we might respond to is, is uh, a, probably the most likely kind of thing that might make us deviate from, from the plan. But I, th I think we should allow for the possibility that something 
that we don't even foresee right now might happen that might make us want to um, go back to masking. So I, I just, I don't know how the language, how the language should be, but um, uh, well, I think, I think we should work toward that. So like flexibility um, in anticipation that there could be unforeseen either modifications or situations. So right. I think so. And, and I think one of the things we saw, especially with the reopening last year, is I think we intended to give kind of uh, metrics that provided guidance, but with flexibility. And I think especially as that gets communicated to hundreds or thousands of people, um, it gets much harder to maintain the nuance. And so just wanting to say like, this is the general approach. This is the kind of general like, are we close? And I think we're getting close to a place where it's reasonable to pursue, though again, not without risk. Um, but wanting to be explicit to say, like, I wish I could say that I'm, you know, this will go perfect and we've got nothing to think about, but, you know, there is some uncertainty. And so I don't want people to say, you know, like in school, for example, we could have transmission between teachers, both of whom lived outside of Dover and Sherburn, and Dover and Sherburn could still have a case rate of zero, but we could still have some non-trivial risk at the school for in-school transmission. That would be a time that you'd say, yep, you know, need to do this. Or if we said, hey, you know, again, we haven't seen transmission town hall. I don't expect we will. But if we did, that's certainly something that would say for the people using this space, we should be really thoughtful about what strategies we can do to make work as safe as possible. And so I think we should discuss this more next week, but just wanted to kind of plan it as food for thought so people had some time to think about it before we discuss it as a sort of dedicated agenda item. And that if there are follow-up questions or things that, that we sort of want to investigate further, that I can have some time to try to dig into that before the meeting next week. So if there are either specific topics or, or kind of secondary questions that people have now, feel free to raise them or if things come up, feel free to kind of pass on to Ellen and I'm happy to follow up as I can. It sounds reasonable and that the time does, we do have time to think about how we might express that flexibility. And then, mean, uh, oh, go ahead. Do Sorry. you mean time right now in this meeting or time before our next meeting? Before uh, our next meeting. Before our next meeting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so in terms of context for folks, for the October 28th data, Sherburn's local rate was 7.6 per 100,000 per day. Dover's was 12.5. And the kind of combined local data as it relates to the school, um, was uh, 10.4. So it's possible that both communities could be seven and below with the data released tomorrow in the following week. It's possible that one or both, you know, could have seen a bump that would sort of slow it down. And so we may see something where, you know, um, Sherburn has a case rate, and I don't mean to pick on UK, but we could see something where Sherburn has a case rate that lets us take it off in a municipal building here because the local disease prevalence is low. But if Dover had a higher case rate, we might say, hey, we're in a position to take this off in Sherburn Town Hall, but we're not in a position to take it off at DS because the sort of combined pool population is high. And the reverse could also be true. Like Sherburn could have um, high disease prevalence while Dover could remain well controlled and we could end up with a mismatch. Go ahead, Kay. So we did talk too, though, about um, perhaps um not having not not uh, about waiting some for um gi giving people in the 5 to 11 age group the opportunity to be vaccinated before we um rescind so, the mask mandate in the schools so i think that um i think that that's appealing i think in terms of what we're hearing about rollout and how rapidly that'll happen i think there's some balance where with vaccine access, with a different formulation, it seems like things are rolling out much more quickly than the adult vaccines did initially. Um, I think it's definitely one of the things we can talk about next week too. And I think for that level, what I'd say is, like, I think that's a great thing to talk about, like um, sort of how do we see that? How do we think about that and include that in the discussion? Um, and, that, and that certainly could color what timeline we end up recommending. I think the way that this was posed Previously was that uh, we sort of had two, two types of communication that went to the school committees. We had the mandatory vaccination, which was 
uh, a requirement and that they've then implemented that, that sort of external regulatory requirement. I think that the masking policy um, was a recommendation that was then adopted by the school committee, although I think it's really unlikely that they would pursue something that was discordant. I think, you know, having that discussion to give the guidance to, to kind of guide the process, I think is worthwhile. Um, and I do think, you know, there's lots of important questions about things like access to pediatric vaccine, you know, timing as it relates to Thanksgiving or Christmas. And I think, you know, my own personal opinion is we're going to always end up with some reason that makes it complicated for a thoughtful person, which I think we are. And, you know, it's hard to know for sure what's right, but, you know, we're never going to regret doing our best, whatever we land on. So I think that's a great issue, Kay. I just want to add for people on the meeting who might not sort of live and breathe this as much that um, there is basically not going to be any discussion of unmasking at the elementary level. I know you sort of said that, Matt, but I just want to sort of put a point back on it now that we're talking about pediatric vaccines. Yep. The school unmasking would really, the only place that would be eligible yet would be the high school. Um, and then my guess is the middle school will come next because it's really just the sixth graders there. Um, but I wouldn't anticipate that even being possible until realistically mid-December. Um, and that's assuming like the whole sixth grade class got in on the first round of, of pediatric vaccines. So yeah. I think we're not going to see sort of substantial vaccination rates in the younger students until sort of December, January. Um, so really the, the school masking is only, only for the high school. And I think masking will continue to be required on the buses for high school students because the bus requirement is separate from our local requirements. I think that's a federal requirement as I understand it. And also the middle schoolers and high schoolers are on the same buses. Yep, yep, 100%. Yeah. Um, and, and so like, but I would say like high schoolers who ride the bus will still need to say like, yep, got a mask, need a plan. This does not mean my life is maskless. It means my time at, you know, kind of in the classroom maybe. Um, yep. And I think there is some appeal to kind of, I, I don't think this is a place where you want to be the earliest adopter, but I do think you know, we sort of have made a commitment to the community to say, like, we're going to do the best we can to find the balance between normalcy and safety. I think this is, like, my own opinion is, I think this is a reasonable balance, but I think that'll be the focus of our discussion next week. Hey, hey Matt, um, I guess a question or slash comment. Um, because the populations and implications are very different for municipal buildings versus schools, you know, I think it's fine to have a discussion about both of those um, aspects as, you know, the Board of Health for, for our towns, but I don't think we need to link sort of the no, policy. Right. Yep. Okay. So I think what I would say is I think at least the way I'm thinking about it is my opinion is that similar levels of community spread to the degree that you're using community spread may be reasonable. And some of that balances the fact that kids, while not at no risk, are likely lower risk than the average occupant or entrant to a town hall in terms of risk of complications of COVID. You balance some of that with saying kids have a much larger congregate group setting that you're assembling in terms of a classroom. Like it is uncommon to have 20 to 25 people in town hall in a room together for an hour and a half. Um, and so I think there's, I, I do think you could arrive at different pieces. I think it would be reasonable to say, you know, arriving at seven may be necessary, but not necessarily sufficient, and that you could then tailor that to specific scenarios. I think that's a great topic for next week, too. Agreed. And is pool testing continuing at the school? Because that would also be a difference from the uh, municipal building setting. So only pool testing is good. Yeah, so pool test, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I was just gonna say only, pool testing is only happening at the elementary school. It's not happening at the high school because the vaccination rate is so high. Okay. So, okay. So in general, pool testing is best supported in populations with low vaccination rate. I think um, you will still see pool testing in places like universities, which are really, really okay, catching some false positives because they really, 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 really don't want the disruption of a case. But in general, you know, kind of re reviewing the data, I think it's reasonable to limit pool testing to unvaccinated populations, though that could change with time. That's a current... Um, kind of DESI guidance for how to roll it out. And so that's what we've been doing is just elementary. And I think we'd continue there. I think test and, uh, test and stay would remain applicable for that subset of students who is unvaccinated and potentially exposed. Um, but I don't think pool testing.
And so, Ellen, I would propose we kind of update the agenda accordingly. I think we should probably open the discussion primarily focused around school, because I think that'll be what the largest number of attendees are interested in, but it can kind of intercalate um, the municipal building discussion. Does that sound okay with you, Kay? Yes, it does. Um, Matt, anything else to add? No. Okay, sound good. Uh, Ellen, do you have what you need from us in, in that topic? Yes, I do. Perfect. And any community questions on this topic? Perfect. Sounds good. Um, okay. So, Kay, I think you're off the hook for the rest of our meeting, but we look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. 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 So, I. Uh, I would take up the discussion of the part-time public health nurse because I'm gonna guess that Arthur Fenno, you might be here for that. But now with the topic added about the um, shared services option and the MAHB proposed op-ed letter, I'd like to lump those together and that will go beyond the six minutes that we have. So uh, let's that? do- Oh, go yes? ahead. What's the okay. ETR topic? Is that something we can get done in six minutes? Yes, I, I do believe we can. All right. So uh, does anyone want to talk about this? Otherwise, I'll just mention that it's, there is a lab that was found not to I'll be sorry, I'm not going to find the best word for this, be worthy of having the certification that it previously had with MassDEP. Uh, and so, as you can see, some of the, these are very serious problems. Agree, egregious, Daryl. Very. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the word we're, we want to use. <laughs> Um, it, it takes so, a lot to get decertified, so that, that and it implies that there wasn't an effort to remedy them or not a satisfactory right. effort. Yeah. So, so because there are fewer and fewer labs in the state that are doing this kind of work, so it's unfortunate. All right. Does anyone have any questions about that? No, I think I saw them recommended on next or today for a homeowner who is looking for testing. So I think it just highlights the limited choices that are out there, unfortunately. Yes. All right. We do, we do in the office have a list of testing labs that we do give out and request it. Hey, Ellen, do you want to send that list to me and I can take a look at it? Because a lot of commercial labs will also do um, private Okay, yeah, it's it's a very short list, but so yeah. short, yes, I will send it to you. Okay, thanks. There are only two labs that I'm aware of that will take homeowners. There were more in the past, and one is Neshoba, which is in Air, and another one is, and I forget the name, but it's in Middleborough. So either one, it's a bit of a haul for dropping off samples. Uh, they're about an hour away from Sherborne. Um, well, with with the PFAS private well sampling, though, I know that there's additional labs who have been doing that type of work, so I can inquire. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be great to know because Alpha used to take homeowner and no longer does. Okay. So it sounds like for next steps, Ellen will send Lisa the list. Lisa will see if the list looks good or if there's anything to add, and then we can just update the file. That sounds good. Awesome. All right, and let's do the permit renewal for JC Parmenter. Have we received everything that we need from them, Ellen? And are they yeah. in good standing with us? Uh, yes, we've received everything we need. Administratively, they're in good standing with us. Mark can probably advise if- okay. Yeah, and I work. work with Jace. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ellen. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. And JC Palmetto has worked in our town a few years, in the past few years. Uh, they just forgot to renew their permit. And 
they do have a job lined up. So uh, that's why they're here a little late in the game, but they have had a good record. And I just, they didn't forget, it's typically um, the installers don't renew their permit until they have a job. So they don't that's want to spend true. the money if they don't have if they don't have a job in town, but they do and they will very soon be getting a renewal um, letter. So they'll be, they're applying for now and they'll have to in January apply um, to have it renewed for 2022. Yeah, and I, Ellen, I think, and for the board, I think we're going to find more people renewing it uh, at the time when we send out those apps applications because there's a major demand right now for installers based on the amount of work. Okay, interesting. All right, how about we do the minutes for approval from October 20th? Oh, sorry. Oh, vote. yes, we need to vote. What a good idea. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say. <laughs> it will be conditional to a pre-construction conference with the agent prior to any work being Okay, excellent. So do we have a motion to approve uh, the permit renewal subject to the condition noted by Ellen? So moved. Seconded. Any other comments? Daryl, aye. Matt Beavers, aye. Lisa, aye. Rebecca Honeywell, aye. Matt Vitale, aye. Okay. Okay. We have less than a minute. So Matt, would you like to open up the discussion about 53 Farm Road? Uh, perfect. And Daryl, while I'm doing that, can I, uh, I just want to make sure that we sort of have mutually agreed on kind of plan um, with Mr. Murphy and Mr. Murchison. So I think it looks like the, the most recent plan I have is the one labeled new septic plan 21-106 includes well 21-97 received 922. Is that the most current? Uh, no, uh, I don't think that's. No. That's one. one without the bump out. The revision date is uh, noted on it as 10-28-21. Um, perfect. Um, so this is the revision three. I thought this was the most recent. Is yeah, this the most yeah, recent perfect. one, Mark? Uh, it is, uh, Daryl. What they didn't label one of the revisions, but this is the most recent revision that perfect. was received on October twenty eighth. All right, and um, and just uh, to confirm this piece, Mr. Murphy, that's right with you guys as well. Yes. Perfect. So I just want to introduce, because I think we spent a, a substantial amount of time uh, last meeting, and I, I kind of want to take a somewhat different approach today. Um, so the issue we're considering today is a combined plan incorporating both the, the well as positioned here and the septic. I think there was an issue that was raised at the last meeting in terms of the water course. And so that seems like the most salient issue to address. I had a couple of follow-up questions that I was hoping to confirm that I'll then confirm at the end. Um, but I think a question for Mark is in terms of the setbacks, at least in my review of the plan, I have a couple of pieces I'd like to see clarified and updated, but it appears that the plan satisfies the property line setbacks for the well and the SAS, and that the soil testing data is compatible with the plan without, um, without variances, is that right? That is correct, Matt. And uh, they do have the correct amount of soil testing within the soil absorption area. Okay. And so it, it sounds like mode. perfect. That, that's super helpful, Mark. And I really appreciate your review on this. So what I would propose that we do is that we, you know, kind of focus our discussion on, on the question of the water course that was raised uh, last time. And I know that Daryl done some follow-up there, and then we can kind of talk through next steps. Um, if there are no objections to that, um, I'd like to ask Daryl, who kind of talked to DEP, to walk us through that. Okay, so uh, actually Mark and I both spoke with DEP on the issue of water courses. And 
I guess the short, I'll give the short version and then you can ask any other questions we could maybe fill in information. The EPA does have a definition for a water course. They call it an ephemeral stream that applies to this, where the primary function is to carry waters periodically from a precipitation event. And the regulations so that MassDEP is most concerned with is what falls under the jurisdiction of the conservation commissions. And the criteria for those kind of water courses have to do with flora, fauna, uh, particular types of soils related to um, wetland conditions, and also whether there's a connection to groundwater. And so this has gone through the review of the Conservation Commission. And for those criteria, it does appear to be something that's strictly drainage, let me just point out. So there is uh, a pipe that comes from under the road and it's, this is now labeled swale, I notice. Um, I don't know if people can see that. Hold on, I have to admit people, all right. Uh, that comes along here, I'm sorry, more people. All right, um, and then there's a depression and it, the water presumably flows along here. In the long term, there might be concerns about changing any dynamics, flow dynamics related to that, that would then create conditions that could cause problems on other people's property or somehow encroach upon the septic system. But from the mass DEP's perspective, and Mark, you could weigh in too, uh, this sort of water course is not something that they see as a problem for septic systems, of course, provided that it's not running through the septic system uh, or that there's any reason to think that the septic would be um, contributing to that flow. And Daryl, can I, can I try to put it another way to make sure I understand it? So, you know, so my impression from what you're saying is that there's sort of this question of, you know, for the purposes of compliance with Sherburn's septic system regulations, the question of is this an applicable water course was sort of the central question. It sounds like we then turned to DEP to say, is this a water course from your point of view as it relates to septic? They said no. So then we would revert to, you know, sort of CONCOM definitions and others, which does not define it as an applicable water course. And so then the setback isn't triggered. Though again, I would say I certainly would be supportive to if there are strategies that can be done to limit any diversion flow or any things that may put further water there, that would be appealing. But it sounds like from a water course standpoint, it doesn't meet the definition that would be required to trigger a setback requirement. Uh, that is what Mass DEP indicated. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? One sec, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, they basically indicated to us that the water course definition falls under the Conservation Commission. So it would be up to them to define if they feel the ephemeral stream is a water course. Um, at this time, I haven't heard that they have, but that's where the jurisdiction would lie. And then if it is a water course, then we would work within our regulations for distances to a water course. Okay. And, and so, I should that make correct, it clear Darryl? that. Yep, that was, that was great, Mark. Go ahead, Daryl. I was going to say the reason this came up is because our regulation does refer to water course and these regulations were written prior to any of us being on the board, long before any of us were on the board. So uh, that's why we checked with Mass DEP to see how they would treat it. And they said that there are uh, certainly drainage swales and what have you that relate to septic systems around the state of Massachusetts, and that has not been something that is a concern to them vis-a-vis -vis the soil absorption systems. So that's why we were 
connecting with them, they said the key for them was the section in the um, wetlands regulations and the definition there. And also the Rivers Act would be another. So it's not only wetlands, it's also Rivers Act. And this does not qualify as a river. And so kind of with that piece, what I would propose, and I sort of look to Mr. Murphy as well, is I'd like to hear from the butters and then let Mr. Murphy and Mr. Murchison comment on any issues that are raised there, uh, since I think it's unlikely that you have strong disagreements with anything that's been stated so far. Does that sound reasonable? It sounds reasonable to hear from the abutters first. Perfect. So if any abutters have questions, comments, concerns, feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll do our best to help address uh, kind of any questions or concerns you have as best we can. Um, and Lisa, can I ask you to, to kind of be a watcher for hands too? Will do. Um, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Moore, go ahead. We're working on the video. Hold on one second. Sorry. No worries. We know the feeling. Can you, can you, uh... There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, Brian Moore, 49 Farm Road. My wife, Mary's right here as well. Um, so we've obviously been talking to Bob quite a bit about uh, the development that's going on next door at 55 and 65 Farm Road. And uh, we're rather friendly with uh, Bob and Allison, and we feel as though Bob should not be denied any opportunity to develop his land under the bylaws that were written by the town. <clears throat> the caveat that comes with that is the strict adherence to the bylaws that were written by the town in order to control such development in areas, whether it's one acre or three acre or whatever type of zoning it is, we feel as though <clears throat> we're kind of backed into a corner at this point because the applicant has gone forward with many different types of uh, permitting. And it started with uh, the ownership of one of two parcels and then an option on a second partial, which he did not own, <clears throat> but then leveraged for water wells to allow for the development of parcels through a traditional contemporary permitting method, which is the ANR development process. Now, I have no problem with the ANR development process, and I have no problem with the open space development process. I have a problem with an applicant playing a, uh, a type of a shell game where permitting is done under the auspices of one program and then leveraged against a board or a committee in order to force them to approve the development under a different program. And we're sitting at a junction at this point in time where all of the neighbors, and I'm not just speaking for myself here, and I hope other neighbors will chime in because I know several of them are logged in tonight. I might be a mouthpiece here, but I am not the only person who feels that this dense development in our neighborhood is entirely out of character for what Farm Road is. And if any, if any of you are interested in really understanding Farm Road, I encourage you to come attend a tavern or to read Bill Rogers' book or understand that this is a scenic road almost unparalleled in, in, in you know, today's Massachusetts. So I encourage the board, our elected representatives, to consider the implications of allowing someone, this applicant in particular, and his attorney, to come in here and go through a &R development process using the, the, um, the metrics of both lots that he owns to, to leverage in wells and septics and other stuff, and then turn around when he's exhausted and depleted those resources and essentially take, well, I can't do anything else with this scrap land, so I'm gonna do an open space development. Now I am pissed as a neighbor. I like Bob, I like Allison, but I am pissed that this process has not afforded any of the neighbors any opportunity 
to weigh in on the density of this development. You're talking about putting 125 feet, 130 feet, whatever it is from my property line, 50 bathrooms flushing into the ground. We have till deposits, which are five, 10, 15 feet thick. They're not gonna take that. My backyard is going to be a artesian septic pool for this 16 acres, 10 houses, 50 bedroom development. Now I'm sorry that, that maybe people don't wanna hear this, but the process itself is not protecting the character of this neighborhood, the zoning of this neighborhood or anything else. And I'm sorry, Bob, I apologize to you. You obviously know I'm frustrated with the process and the permitting. We've been emailing each other back and forth and I, I apologize for having this tone but I don't think that this board understands the implications of their vote tonight. And when they vote on this, it is a rubber stamp on letting any developer do anything they want anywhere in town. If Bob has plans, those plans should have been vetted on day one with this is what I wanna do. And it should have been the whole thing, open space development. Instead it's, oh, I can, carve out some extra profit here and a little more development here. And, oh, when I get done, I got this garbage land left over. I'm gonna do an open space. I feel as though, I feel as though none of our voices as neighbors have been heard. And I hope the board takes that very seriously. And I'm done with my comments tonight. Arthur, I uh, see your hand up. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, so uh, I'm Arthur Fenno. I live at 58 Farm Road, uh, which is um, approximately, well, it's across the street from uh, this development. It's sort of diagonally across the street, but, you know, in a butter, it's a 65 Farm Road. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's, Brian's a hard act to follow because he said pretty much everything that I would say. Uh, I completely agree with him. Uh, I second everything that he said, uh, including the lack of transparency, to the extent that he touched on that uh, in this whole process, and the uh, what seems to be sort of a, a, a going around and getting pieces of, pieces of the project approved here and there without really giving the boards and the town and the abutters. Uh, Sorry, I also work on the fire department. One sec. Okay. My apologies. Um, without giving the the town and the abutters uh, a real sense of of what's going on, and kind of getting bits and pieces approved here and there, uh, as opposed to this is what I want to do, being upfront, coming to the the neighbors and the abutters and the boards, um, you know, sort of ex ante, as opposed to um, you know, kind of in a, in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, I, 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 I can't help but infer that there's, um, there are things hidden. There was a reason for that. There was a strategy and maybe that's an effective strategy, but that's not how I like to see my neighborhood developed. It's not how I would treat my neighbors. Uh, and, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's a unfortunate, I, have another word in mind, but I think it's an unfortunate way of doing business uh, in a town where we're all trying to do the same thing. We all moved here for the same interests and the same reasons, uh, a chief among which, or, or at least one of the principal reasons was that it's it's scenic beauty. Uh, Farm Road, as Brian said, is, is um, unique. Uh, it is a designated scenic road. Uh, and this development, which we're only seeing a small portion of, will forever change that. I mean, there's no, there's no going back. And I understand that that's not the specific discrete issue that's in front of the board. But again, with, as with the other commissions that I've, I've spoken to and the other boards that I've made comments to, I don't think this can be looked at as just the small piece. You have to look at the entire puzzle and see how this would affect Farm Road, how it would affect the, uh, the trees, the waters, the to topography, um, and uh, in a way that, that there's, there's no going back from. I mean, Farm Road will never be the same again. It's a road that we all moved into. We all thought that this was 
you know, the character that we bought into. And I understand that that's not, a, there's no guarantee it's going to always stay that way. But that was our understanding. And that's, that's one of the things we liked about Sherwood and this part of Farm Road. And I think the, the, the Board of Health, the Conservation Commission, the other boards need to be mindful that the, the decisions they're making will forever alter Farm Road in a way there's no going back from. I guess in terms of what's really on the table, you know, I, I don't, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't understand water course, I don't understand uh, a lot of the, the regulations and things, but looking at this, um, looking at this, these developments and seeing all the different properties that really are kind of gerrymandered to squeeze as many different lots and parcels into what previously was a a, a one house parcel on five or six acres and then a horse farm. Um, I think the zoning bylaws, uh, the, the, the health the health and regulation bylaws, the zoning bylaws, the town bylaws weren't made to, weren't made to protect the health interests when you're really shoehorning in a number of properties like that. I mean, we, we live on a, a couple acres or other houses live on a couple acres, even that's just on one acre, there, there's provision in the, in the bylaws sort of, or the, the, the regulations um, recognize that there are septic systems and wells and they make kind of provisions for that. And if you're trying to fit in such a densely packed development into a small area, I don't, I don't think that the current regulations as they stand can really, can, can withstand that. I think it exploits them in a way that will negatively affect our drinking water. And, uh, you know, Brian, I think probably will, and Brian and Mary will probably receive the brunt of this because they're they're literally downstream, but I think it will affect all the rest of us. And I don't think there's been sufficient discussion, uh, or study, or uh, or really anything to my mind to to protect the interests of all of us from what is was really an out of character development uh, that that I, I think is it was it would be unfortunate on Farm Road. I think it'd be unfortunate uh, in in virtually any of these roads in Sherburn. And I think we'll. If this board allows it, and if, if things go forward, will forever negatively impact uh, Sherburn and, and Farm Road and its its um, the, the scenic nature of it that we all enjoy. I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, I see Rob Byrne, and then uh, the, if there are further better comments, we may take a pause to to just let the board address some of the, the specifics that were raised because I think there's some important points there. Um, but let's do Bob and then Susan, and then we'll pause for some comment for the board, uh, and then we'll let the applicant uh, opine. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Rob Byrne, I live at 60 Farm Road, so I, I'm right across from uh, 55 and 53 here. Um, I, I agree with what Brian and Arthur said. I share the same concerns. Um, you know, number one is we really need to be looking at this whole plan holistically. I mean, we're talking about a lot of houses in here and trying to put in a lot of septic and a lot of wells. And, you know, frankly, this land has a lot of water on it. From what I, from what I hear, there are a lot of wells that had to be drilled, a lot of boreholes that had to be drilled before they, you know, they could find a few that would percolate. And the previous owner wanted to put one house on this lot and wasn't able to do so because of the poor drainage in, in, in the lot. Um, so, so that's my, that's my one concern. Um, I also am really worried about what's going to happen to water flowing into Brian's lot, water flowing into this vernal pool that's on the property, and frankly, what's going to happen to our wells as well. And my third concern is just about the the absurdly gerrymandered lots. And I know that may not be specific to this discussion today, but it's got to come up somewhere. And I, I'm trying to read this map on here, but I see these a sliver of land that looks like it's about a hundred feet long and maybe three feet wide. And, and that's counting as frontage. And, and you're really gonna say that that's part of one person's property and not another person's property. It, it seems like an absurd perversion of what the bylaws intended as, as far as lot sizes and, 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 and frontage and setbacks. Um, so, and then lastly, you know, I, I don't know Bob and, um, you know, I want to give, I, I would like to give everyone the benefit of the doubt and I would love to have them be able to develop their properties in a respectable manner. And I don't want to sit here and complain, say that no lot that I could ever see could ever be developed. But the idea that we're going to cram so many houses onto this land, it, it, you know, at the same time that the developer um, took a case to the state Supreme Court because a neighbor across the street wanted to put one house on a 
on a three acre lot and he might be able to see it a little bit from his office. I, I think it's just, it, it's very hypocritical. And, um, you know, because of that I, reason. I, 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 would, I, would, I mean, I just ask like, there really shouldn't be personal commentary. Like, I think if you want to comment on the plans, that's fine. I think if, sort of for personal behavior hypocrisy or those pieces, that's probably out of scope for what's appropriate in our meeting tonight. Okay, thank you. I'm done speaking, appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Um, Susan and then Josh, I see your hand up, but I would like to address some of that uh, before we get to you. Um, so Susan, go ahead, because you had your hand up. Uh, then we'll have a brief comment, then we'll have Josh and then Mr. Murphy and Mr. Murchison. Great, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what everybody else has said. Uh, one other thing I do want to just point out is we have had to have our well fracked and, um, you know, I can only imagine we're on the same aquifer as everybody else here. So, you know, we're only looking at 55 right now, but one problem, as Brian mentioned, is that this board and all of the boards should be really looking at this entire project as a whole because there's a lot of implications that will come with it. And the biggest thing is going to be the wells. And if you're looking at all of these houses that are proposed to be built, and you look at what our guidelines are for the town of Sherburn, what is the, the, the yield? I think it's 300 gallons per five uh, per bedroom. And I think Bob's proposing five bedroom houses. You know, you could be looking at 15,000 gallons a day um, not to mention sprinkler systems or pools, et cetera. So that's gonna have a huge impact on the neighbors in this particular area. It's extremely dense. And I think that's something that the board needs to really look at with respect to this. So I'm done. Thanks Sue. And I, I would like to just make a set of comments and then I'll let Josh speak and then uh, Jim and Mr. Murchison if they're so inclined. Um, I think one of the things that's really important to acknowledge and to be clear about here is that the jurisdiction of the board does not extend to whether or not the, the border here is defined to include the city of Zurich or sort of the other pieces of the property that have these sort of bizarre peninsulas and other things. And so there's some parts of this that whether or not we agree with you sort of immaterial because, you know, for the purposes of a lot line, the peninsula counts, the well satisfies the distance from the peninsula. And so we can't after a project's proposed say, hey, we're gonna change the regulation that now applies to you. So there's no action that the board can take now that can change the rules to mitigate the risk of sort of the gamesmanship strategy that may or may not be in play here. And we've certainly seen this in other properties in town where we had a set of development on Maple that led to the neighbor's well potentially being fouled as a result of um, ledge disruption. And so that then started a long laborious process that we spent, I think, Daryl probably has a timeline better than I do, and Lisa as well, you know, upwards of a year spent, you know, working on that, doing that, doing our due diligence, passing an update to the regulation, getting community feedback, getting lots of constructive feedback where people thought we were wrong, all of those pieces. And so there's nothing we can do today that will change the set of rules that apply to this development, though there certainly may be lessons learned that say, hey, this is another area of risk or potential gap that was identified. So. I don't want it to feel to you guys like we don't care about that or that it's not things that are important, but that we have to be really specific about what is our purview. And for the purposes of this project, um, you know, if you can just get the- Oh yeah, sorry. That's sorry. not bad. Um, you know, for the purposes of this project, we are somewhat constrained and some of that may be related to strategies on the part of the applicant. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that we can then say, no, 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 we're, we're coming up with a new rule and we're applying it now. And so I think that some of the concerns you're raising about the unique nature of Farm Road or the aesthetic value of it, I certainly wouldn't disagree. And it's my favorite road to drive down through Sherburn, but that's not a Board of Health question. I think that's a zoning question. And that question has been answered by that board and they certainly may need to revisit it or learn lessons from it to apply to other areas, but we can't sort of unilaterally say that, you know, that rule needs to be different. I do think the valid questions and holding the applicant accountable to the standards that we have is certainly in scope and reasonable. And, and that's part of what our job is. I don't want it to feel like that. Um, you will be frustrated, whatever we land at, as I would be in your circumstances. 
but I want to be clear about there's some things that it appears you guys want from the Board of Health that we cannot possibly do because it's not our purview. And I think it's important to say that out loud as we said that for other large projects in town, not to be dismissive, but to steer you in the right direction to say, the people you wanna to talk to about this are X, Y, or Z and not us. Because if we say, hey, yeah, no, this is great stuff. We should address it. Like we, we can't be the ones who help you with it because we don't have regulations that speak to it. And so I think part of what we're trying to do is to say, where are the regulations we have? Where are the rules we follow? There certainly may be lessons learned from this but we, we still stuck with using the rules we have. And I don't know if there are any other comments from other board members, and if not, I'll, I'll kind of pass it over to Josh and then to the applicant. I just wanted to sort of add one thing, because I think a lot of questions have come up about sort of lot size and density. And I think one thing that is within the purview of the board is to ensure that things like setbacks are appropriate, that the system is sized to allow for nitrogen loading given the, the size of the lot, um, that test pits are done, that perk rates are appropriate, and all of those things are sort of designed to help ensure that, that a, a septic can be placed safely in relation to neighboring wells. Um, and so we, we do have mechanisms in place to look for that. And I can, I can appreciate the frustration um, of the abutters that, that it feels different when it's multiple sort of smaller lots going in together. Um, but I think you know, we do have rules that apply to what can be done on these smaller lots and, and we will apply them in this case as we have elsewhere. But I, I also have a comment. May I can make a comment? I'm on calling sure. in from a phone. Can't. Yep, go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry. So what is in our purview are the risks that are um, that we are potentially facing with um, threatening the aquifer and the potential drinking water quality. And that is our purview. And yes, there were good intentions when this new legislation was, or you know, regulation was put into our town. But I also think it's appropriate, since private water supplies are not regulated by the DEP, that the neighbors um, require the town, including the Board of Health, to be sure that even though there's a desire and there's a regulation in place, that there should not be a risk to drinking water quality um, because it's not regulated by the DEP. So the Board of Health has to care and have to pay attention, even if we have regulations that put us in an awkward position. That's my personal opinion. Daryl, you, you're still sharing it. Oh, there you go. Yes, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on bringing up something. Uh, perfect. Let's go to John. Yes, there is, there is a place where we would address this, not necessarily for 55, but for 65. And I, but you can so keep what, going, what, and I need well, to. Actually, actually Matt, sorry, I had my hand up, but. Oh, I'm um, sorry, Lisa. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, but what I was going to say is this kind of feeds into our sequencing discussion, because um, you know we were asked to evaluate a well approval in absence of you know understanding full septic implications and some of these other issues, which I know currently the sequencing is not necessarily. A requirement of our regulations, although it may be in the future. Um, but this is exactly the kind of situation we should be mindful of, um, because these are the sort of problems that can ensue when you're doing things a piece at a time versus looking at things in totality. So we might want to consider not only the sequencing of for a particular lot, understanding the implications of where the building building is going to be located, the you know um, capacity of the well, and then the sizing of the septic and location of such. But if this is a multi you know lot development, that these kind of things we might want to consider requiring additional information at the time of approval as part of the sequencing process. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Salvin, I think I see your hand up. Thanks, Matt. I, I, I'm not even sure where to start, and I'll try to keep this brief. I mean, this this is all, you use the word strategy, and it's it's a perfect, perfect word. This is all a strategy on the part of a, of a land developer who has no interest of this town or the abutters in mind. And, you know, I got an email from him a couple of weeks ago, pretending to be transparent and sending things that I hadn't seen in the two years that he'd been developing this and asked me to believe in science, particularly given my, an engineering, I think was the exact quote, given my profession and my career. And Mr. Murchison, I, you know, I respectfully, if you give me a minute to finish, the, the, 
let's let's do that. You know, I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist in the sense of of understanding this stuff. But I, I you know, I, the little bit that I do understand about this, you know, they're looking. They they presented an application that's that looks at putting 1,988 gallons of water into or septic, I'm sorry, a day from this development that he's piecemealed together and strategized to get through these various boards, which is what, 12 gallons a day less than what the 2,000 gallon requirement would be for a full EHIR review. I mean, how, how, are we, how is that within the spirit of anything that the Board of Health could not take jurisdiction over? It just doesn't make any sense. That they, they're putting that, the septic system next to what they're planning potentially. I mean, who knows what, what Mr. Murchison has in mind, but what he's telling me is five other septic systems that are being crammed into one and a half acres. It's, it's what 4,000 gallons of septic a day that's gonna go into these tanks. There's nowhere for that to go, nowhere for it to go. And if one of those tanks has a problem or one of those, those owners ends up with difficulty, they're out of luck as are everybody else on Farm Road, including the Butters, the Moors, everybody involved in this, in this you know, strategized project. So I, I, I respectfully asked that the Board of Health do take a step back, not learn from this from the next time, but, but take some action immediately to see what's going on here on the part of this developer and protect the rights of the abutters and the people that are going to be impacted when they buy these homes and realize that they don't have an appropriate water drainage, they don't have an appropriate septic system in place. And you know, the, I don't even know how you can say that this fulfills the spirit of what the town that I bought into because of the re <laughs> all the things that have been outlined again, I won't go into that. I, I, it just, it's, it's frustrating. And I, I really, really would like the Board of Health to take a stand tonight and, and, and look at additional reviews for how we can address both the septic and the water systems here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, with that, we'll sort of go to Mr. Murphy and Mr. Murchison, and then we'll follow up questions from the board. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think it will be productive to respond to some of the comments, particularly the ones that um, unfortunately did have a tone and an edge to them. So I'm going to leave that to the side. I would say that the application before you is compliant with the very strict regulations of the Board of Health. Um, the project has already also gone through a very strict uh, Conservation Commission review. Uh, the project has also gone through and will subsequently go through uh, this particular lot will go through a building permit application. Um, some of the other lots will go through the open space bylaw, which was adopted by the town in 2020. If the town didn't want something like that in 2020, they, they wouldn't have voted for it. They had to vote for it by over two thirds of the town for it to be adopted. So, um, I think what I, maybe what it is that I wanted to hear was that the well is compliant, the septic system is compliant. The, the agent for the Conservation Commission uh, circulated to uh, Chairperson Bridgely, and I assume she sent it along to the other members of the Board of Health that there's no stream intermittent or perennial across the frontage of 55 Farm Road. So there's no water course there of any kind. Um, so uh, in summary, this project in all its aspects, both for the well and the septic system is ripe for approval tonight. And I would ask the board respectfully to grant that approval in the regular course, in the manner and the form that it does for many of the other proposals that occur in the town. I would point out that the septic system here is a septic system which is superior to all of the variance septic systems that are 
regularly approved for the town on a repair and replacement benefit basis. So it, it has a, an incredible amount of rigor that's associated with it. And although it's, this is not garbage land, this is beautiful land. This is going to be beautiful development of beautiful homes for people who would love to live in Sherburne. And um, I hope that they're welcomed. And so with, with, with that, um, Lisa, is it okay if I open, if I start? Sure. Um, so I have a couple of follow-up questions. I think we'll now close the period of public comment uh, kind of on the topic, and then the rest of kind of be deliberation by the board. We may turn to Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murchison. I think I saw uh, Deshang on here as well with follow-up questions. Um, the first question I had is I just want to confirm with the applicant that um, with the transfer and sale of 55 that this SAS in that property uh, had a Title V inspection and passed. Yes, uh, Matt, that is required by law and it did happen. Perfect. And I guess one question I do have as it relates to that site is, I guess this is kind of a question for Deshane because again, you know, to Mr. Murphy's point, I think the parallel of like this exceeds a, a failed system is sort of a little bit of a false parallel because, you know, failed systems, there's a manifest injustice in not being able to continue to use your property, where in the case of a new development, the same standard may not apply. As it relates to 55, um, you know, what I'd like to kind of clarify in kind of in keeping with, I think, a point that Josh raised was, you know, for a future homeowner, I'm trying to picture, uh, Daryl, if you can just scroll up, I think it's best on the first plot. Uh, no, it's better on this second one okay, because perfect. you can see all of. Perfect. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the questions I have is if we consider 55 and we consider that with time, all septic systems will ultimately fail. I guess my question is, as you look at this residual lot, what's your vision for where the 55 homeowner could place a replacement system, recognizing that you haven't done soil testing on that site, but sort of looking at the gerrymandered site and how much of the footprint would not meet property setbacks as a result of the 53 carve out. And I'm sure this is something you've thought about, but I'd, I'd kind of like to get a sense for what you had in mind there. Yes, uh, so this uh, the 55, the existing system was built in the 1960s, no, 1996, uh, 98, that time frame. So it was pretty much compliant with the Title V. And uh, there's uh, plenty room between the trenches as we, designed currently, so there will be reserved, there's a reserved area between the existing one. That's, a, that's just from the layout. And the secondary, even though I didn't do soil testing exactly over there, but just down the slope, we excavated soils down like a 24, 25 feet deep. We didn't even hit the ledge. So that area happened to be a, a very deep, ground moraine soils and there's no water. And I have been doing uh, many, many septic system soil testing and design. This is one of the site. Uh, so uh, I think Mark probably can tell you that too is it just happened to be having a good spot we find. So I don't know why other people didn't find it. So the, the chance from the groundwater, most of the time failed system is due to high groundwater table the systems getting into the water table and uh, which doesn't exist for 55. They are sit right on the top. And secondary, if there's any due to structural failure like a sediment in the D-box or septic tank failure, that's not going to cause any problem. They can easily replace those structures. So, uh, so in, in short, as we have a really good soil condition on the site on both 55 and the new lot with the deep groundwater condition and the relatively uh, permeable soils, but it's not so permeable like in pure sand, have uh, probably one of the best treatment uh, features because the permeability is not too quick, let the wastewater go through. So all that together is going to not only protect the neighbors, if you're looking at, oh, well, well it will be right uh, near the border at that corner. If there's any failure, it will go to us. Uh, to the well we have, rather than go to the neighbors before, uh, before go to the neighbors. 
So in short, that we believe or uh, uh, based on all my testing on the side and understanding uh, hydrogeology and geology, uh, this is probably one of the best soils you can expect for wastewater treatment, uh, on-site wastewater treatment. So. And Shane, can you just orient us to where the well is on at 55? Uh, 55 is in the back, uh, so I don't have this. So when you, when you say, to the when you say sheet. yeah, but so when you say it would foul the well, it would actually foul the well at 53, not 55, because 53 is what's downgrading. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, just a new so well. when you sort of say it'll, like it would foul my well, like 53 and 55 will be different parcels at that point in time. Uh, yeah, if there's any impact, it would be impact the 53 well, the 55 right. wells away on the top. So I, th right, so I think, that, so I think the concern I'm raising is four, <laughs> so 455, the question, and I just want to make sure you're asking the answering the question I was asking. I am concerned for the SAS that we see at 55 that was in 96, and it sounds like you're saying if that system failed, it would foul our well, but in the context of what you're describing, it sounds like it would actually foul the well at 53, which at that point in time would be presumably a second property. That's correct, yeah. Matt, if, if, Matt, can, Matt, can I interrupt not, you? Not, 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 not yet, Bob, I, yeah. like, I get to well, ask you're, my questions. You're going down a road. No, no Bob, Bob, I get to ask my questions and we will recognize you as the board, but we get to do our piece and we will give you the floor. Um, can, Matt, uh, can, can I just follow up with that? So um, I thought there was mention of till. Can you just elaborate when you say that you know, the soils are relatively permeable. And, you know, remember that where, where the wells are screened usually is much deeper than we're talking about for these systems, which is, which is good um, because that means it's, you know, unlikely to necessarily have septics impacting well water quality, but it feeds into the other concern, which is, you know, if we're gonna have um, a dense, sort of um, development here uh, in terms of quality and quantity from a shared aquifer, which we're typically talking about bedrock um, withdrawal for the for the wells. Can can you, you know, allude to, to that and, and sort of describe that as well? And I also am concerned when you're saying like it's going to impact our well, you're really saying it's impacting potentially like Matt was saying, a, a well that's on a different parcel that's going to have a different owner. So, you know, we're typically like less concerned, not that we're not concerned, but we're less concerned if for some reason there was, there was some kind of failure, if it was going to be impacting the residence at which that failure occurred, that's of slightly less concern than if, than if it was going to be impacting an abutter um, and a butter's well. So, so, you know, that actually didn't make me feel very comfortable um, in your discussion. Okay, first of all, uh, it's like an uh, assumption. So it's like in a speculative, I was just trying to say is any well that septic system, if you speculate, they will fail. Uh, that's the first one. And then you say likely to impact when I just say, it's all into a detailed discussion, just as you said, Oh, a well will be a bedrock well. Even the census fail. When I say it will likely impact it, it's just from the position and uh, relativeness, but doesn't mean they are going to impact the water quality as you, uh, uh, Lisa, you are LSP, you know uh, hydrogeology pretty well. So the, I don't think it is a uh, time and that you or me can really uh, get into that detailed conclusion, which is a really sound, facts and the science-based rather than to uh, speculating and uh, to mislead other people. I don't think that's a proper time to discuss, but I really don't think if, uh, uh, from my, if you're really asking me truly whether they will be impacted on the, uh, on the well, it's very unlikely. The reason they are deep bedrock wells are sealed from the unconsolidated soils above. So the failed septic systems may uh, if you uh, want to ask in the environmental impact is back up to the house rather than to the well concern because that's why the well setting up 100 feet for the uh, state code and you have 150 feet under our case to, to this situation. 
So they are quite far away. If it, the unconsolidated soils have some backup, they probably will filter through uh, the organic matters, all that. I don't think anybody in the world can speculate to giving people as a scientist or engineer uh, as a fact. So to scare people or to uh, causing unnecessary uh, uh, concerns at this point. Ms. Shang, I think you're mischaracterizing. I think Lisa said, spoke to your statement. So everything she was saying was, was based on comments you made. Um, I guess my follow-up question, and Mark, just to clarify, again, I, you know, I do think our interest is, is sort of in considering the plan. I may not be enthusiastic about the plan and I may still approve the plan because it may follow all the rules. I do think it's important to be clear and transparent about this is sort of what it all means. So for example, as a single parcel, if 55 failed, the location that an SAS is being placed at 53 would have been an alternative for a single lot. It is no longer an alternative. That may be permissible, but that should be clear and considered in the discussion. Um, Mark, for the purposes of an SAS, if they needed to replace the existing SAS at 55, my recollection is that it cannot have an impervious surface above it, but I don't know if that's, if I'm recalling that correctly. I was wondering if you could clarify that. Like, can you have an SAS here? It's under a driveway because that's where it was placed. Um, if it needed to be replaced, would the driveway then need to be moved? Mark, I, if you're talking, can you, about, yep, can go you ahead. hear me? Okay, uh, my signal is a little weak here, so if I lose you, I also am on a phone here as well. Okay, uh, but just want to let you know that is correct. Uh, unless there's no alternative and then they would have to vent the system, but we do require that all systems be, have a pervious, permeable area above it. So in respect to the driveway going over it, they would have to look at a different location first to see if there's any other suitable locations prior to any waivers being granted to that section of our code. Okay, thanks, Mark. I think, I think those are the, the questions I had, Lisa, Daryl, Matt, Rebecca, I, I don't know who wants to go next. Lisa, I don't know if you want to, if you had any other follow-ups and if not, I can go kind of go through the list. I guess I, I, this is a question um, maybe primarily for Daryl, but um, so in historically when we've had um, denser, you know, multi-family, multi-building developments, we have had requirements to ensure that, you know, in totality, water withdrawal from the proposed new development was not going to be adversely impacting the quality and quantity uh, of the existing abutters. Um, so in this kind of situation, um, do any of those kind of testing requirements apply or are these just being done piecemeal um, lot by lot? And so it doesn't apply. So, this is, uh, I hope you can see section 3.1, which I believe is what you're yep, referring yep, to. Yep, that's up. And that's what I wanted to raise. So this may take some further discussion with planning board and town council, because the way I see it is that, uh, or my understanding, I don't know that I agree with this, but my understanding is that 55 was one lot, that's been divided up. And we're looking at these individual lots now, lot one and lot two, and then there's a back portion that is being attached to the next um, development. So there was a presentation about what's coming on 65. And absolutely for what's coming on 65 and the back portion of 55, I do believe is going to fall under our definition here, which is a proposed project. It's a project. It's not to be viewed as individual lots. It's a project that has a design sewage flow of 2,000 gallons per day or greater. And that will invoke the environmental health impact report requirement for the property for all the reasons we've been discussing here now. Um, the density of septage, uh, effluent, uh, water withdrawals, stormwater flows, 
across the property onto other properties from other properties. And so I think, and I think that the project may be feasible, but it really should go through this kind of evaluation because it is significant. It, uh, just so people know, this falls under regulations and standards for things that are other than a single family dwelling on a single lot. And that would certainly qualify. Now, whether that should be extending to 55, which is two lots, but with a, the back portion of that, I say back, um, portion of that lot being affiliated with 65, maybe that brings all of this under uh, this section of our regulations. I struggle to bring it under. I mean, like, as far as I know, the applicant has not submitted proposals right. related to 65. And so my sort right. of mental model is, again, the sequencing and strategy, but what's allowed is allowed. And, you know, for me, I think what's described at 65 in the sort of composite activities of the enterprise is certainly reasonable. I think for tonight, our purview is probably the, the diet of properties that are sort of listed and applied for, like, I don't think we can invoke the future proposal since we haven't sort of re received an application to that effect. Um, I understand that. The one condition that might affect that, and this could just be whether we move ahead to look at approval of this, is whether we just verify with town council that, because this portion here that, you know, I'm assuming this is the proposed new plot line edge, for the property of lot one. And so this back portion here was previously part of 55 Farm Road is my understanding. And this, as you can see here, connecting over is going to connect to one of the lots over on 65. So it's probably worth us checking with town council and or the planning board as to whether this then unifies all of this or whether we are still, so we've been proceeding under the assumption that we can look at this and certainly for lot two as just a separate new lot that's met planning board requirements and does not fall under our uh, part three of our regulations and that yeah. excerpt that I just showed. So that is, I think a bit of a murky area. Thanks, Daryl. Um, Rebecca, do you want to go next? And then Matt, you can kind of close this out. Rebecca, I see you unmuted, but I'm not sure. Uh, if you... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I made my comment. Um, okay. I have, I think we need to be very cautious and I think we need to not underestimate uh, the cumulative risk of individual decisions that were, you know, it's easy to make things on an individual basis, but we need to have some perspective. Fair enough. And Matt, do you want to close out and then? Um... Sure. I, I mean, I don't have a lot of substantive to add. I mean, I, I, I feel uncomfortable with sort of the way this has all progressed in that I do feel like that there's more coming, but at the same time, I feel even more uncomfortable sort of making up rules on the fly. Um, and you know, I, in my mind, I think we have to view this as one project as, as sort of what we have in front of us. It's not clear to me. I agree. It's a little unclear whether we could lump this in with the, the other proposed project at 65. I don't feel like it gets there right now. Um, and I think that, you know, I keep sort of going back to this mental model that if these were, you know, two separate individuals owning this property, we'd have to sort of apply our usual rules. And I, and I think that we're sort of, while I think I don't love the way the sequencing has been done. And I think we need to address it uh, to ensure this doesn't happen again. It's really hard for me to just say, we're going to do the rule right now because I'm uncomfortable. Um, so I think that's where I'm left. Okay. Um, Mr. Murchison, Mr. Murphy, I asked you to kind of hold any comment. Do you have anything you want to add or clarify to the discussion? Or are you comfortable with the board proceeding to a vote? I would like the vote to the board to vote tonight. Um, yeah. And I, um, I don't, I don't think that that it's necessary or appropriate for any further delays in taking action on these 
what I describe as compliant plans. All right, thanks, Mr. Murphy. Um, so uh, I am happy uh, to take a stab at um, a kind of a motion. I would invite others to to kind of add language. And again, I would say I think you know my own personal position is much like Matt's, which is that I'm not enthusiastic, but I also think. If things follow the rules, they follow the rules. If we don't like how it turns out, we need to change the rules for next time, but it can't change today. I do uh, echo Daryl's impression that I think, you know, ultimately this looks like it's going to be a project to me, but I don't think we've hit that threshold on this parcel. Um, but again, I would say, you know, in considering it in conjunction, I think that it does appear to fall within that, the kind of purview of the environmental health impact statement as we get into the plans that have been raised, but I don't feel like I can act on those plans without an application. I, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to act on an idea. So I would encourage, you know, I think this is one where uh, I suspect we'll see variation on how the board lands. And, you know, I think that's okay. I think there are a couple of pieces that I'd like to flag as conditions to any approval of a plan. I think one is that it would be conditional on having a final, uh, delineation of exactly where the driveway will be and an inclusion of the barriers that will be present since that's uh, meaningful for the well setback. I don't think that will pose an issue, but just to say, I, like I wanna see that finalized on a plan before a plan is released. Um, I'd like to see it conditional. Uh, so for that, I think it's just finalizing the driveway position. And, and Bob, my recollection is it was ultimately land on that the driveway will not be moved. So the update would only be that we take out the suggestion of movement and we would add the barriers as we discussed last week. Do I have do I have the facts of that right? Yes. So obviously, I don't want to uh, commit to moving a driveway that I don't need to move if if my well is compliant. And now yeah. that I've realized that you have in your rules, and I apologize, I didn't realize it, but nobody at the Board of Health pointed it out to me, uh, that if I put in barriers, uh, then I can come closer than 20 feet to the driveway, which would uh, negate the need to rip up a bunch of asphalt and pour up. To 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 totally fine. So just to make, make sure then on the condition, what we would need is where we sort of have a demarcation on this plan of this is the driveway removed, this is the driveway added, those would then be both removed to just leave the driveway as it's currently present, and there would be a barrier added to reflect that requirement. Does that sound yeah. right to you, Bob? Yes, but obviously, Matt, we would put the barrier in after we've uh, totally, done the to well. uh, Totally, 100%. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. it just it would, be, it would be included on the plan. So we could say, hey, this is our shared expectation of what will happen. I think that if you then said, hey, we thought it would be a four foot stone and it would be here. If it's in a three foot stone and it's there, I, I don't anticipate that being an issue, but I, I would want the plot the plan to reflect what's actually planned. Um, well, yes, I guess and we need to review and approve it prior, which the board has shared that information with you. Not only is it in the regulations, but I provided you guidance about that when you asked about it. So that, uh, yep, that is the standard procedure is that you tell us what your plan is for guarding it. As I said, we've built in flexibility on what kind of protection is uh, provided for wells because people have all different tastes about whether they want to look at a bollard or a boulder or a wall or something else or a fence. And, and so I, we've tried to make it flexible. And so please do that, provide it to us, and we will review it for adequacy. And, and so again, I, I would view this as conditional. So I would view us as taking a vote tonight, and the release of the plan would then be conditional to that being provided to the agent acting on our behalf. I guess um, what we're trying to find out is whether or not we can drill the well. We certainly understand that you will not give us a final approval of that well until and unless such an approved uh, barrier is displayed and approved. I, I don't have any problem with that, but we would like to drill the well. We know that we can't have it approved until that happens. And I, I think that that, that nuance is, is a, a respectful uh, so, so I'd say for me, like what I'd say is honestly, there's been so much back and forth. Like I want one plan that reflects exactly what we're going to do because I don't want to say, well, this plan says we're going to move the driveway, but we're really not moving the driveway. Like okay. Matt, I'll move the driveway. Vote on I it. I, 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 would, I would say like, Bob, I'm going to ask you not to interrupt me. What I'm saying is 
we have had back and forth. We have had sequencing. I am happy to get there. If you want to say I want to move your driveway, that is also fine with me. I want one answer from you about what you will be doing, and I want a plan that reflects that. The permit will be then conditional on that plan because I don't want to have back and forth about issues that I think can be readily resolved. But I, I don't want to have a plan that right now this plan says we're moving something and you're telling me we're not. I want to see something that says this is what we're actually doing. I think we can vote on it tonight, but I think that we need to have a plan that reflects what you actually plan to do. And so, and so just to put a, a blunt point on that, if you don't want to move the driveway, we just need a plan that shows it not moving and that you're going to build a barrier there. I understand, Matt, and I've waited a long, long time to have this approved, and I've waited a long, long time to be and given Bob, permission you, to build this well, and I would like to build it. And, no, and, you, and, and you may well get approved, and we also get to set the conditions that we can release that to you, Bob. Right, yeah. but what, so you just said was, what you just said was you may well be approved. I, well, we haven't yeah, voted we haven't yet. Voted. You said may well because we haven't voted yet, Bob, so you have to wait till we vote to know if you're approved. That's all he was saying. Yep, and we, and we do we do conditional approvals all the time. So we can say we approve this contingent upon satisfying these conditions, and that's that's a very normative approval process. And so my question for you, Bob, is I need to condition the condition properly. If you're moving it, then I don't need to condition it on the presence of a barrier. If you're not moving it, then I need to condition on the presence of a barrier. So that's the clarity I need from you, so that we can have the right condition as it applies to the proposal. With due respect, Matt, can we do this? I'll, I'll make a proposal. You approve moving the driveway and drilling the well. If I decide I don't want to move the driveway, I'll bring a new drawing, I'll remove the moving of the driveway, and I'll show you the barrier I'm going to use instead. That seems like a, a reasonable- And so, so then that would then be concordant with this plan as listed? Yes. Okay. Um, and what is going to be our, we just, Matt, we just need a safety valve because then we're going to have a well too close to a driveway with no plan for protecting it. There's can going we to do be it? Can we do it? So, I, so I think this is conditional to the plan to move the driveway. If the applicant then decides to not move the driveway, then they'll need to return with a plan that lists the barrier. Well, can we, could we do the condition both ways? It will, could, could it be an either or? Either move the driveway so that it satisfies the setback requirement or um, provide a barrier. Okay. Yeah, like I, I, I think I would be okay. I, I think that I'm comfortable. I just think that we are, there are way too many moving parts. I think we should vote on what's ready, what's in front of us, and we should just okay. not do conditional approval. It's just too confusing. The thing is changing every 10 minutes and we are putting ourselves at risk and who's going to enforce it? We're all very busy. I think so, we vote on what's in front of us in a final form. So I think, uh, I hear you, Rebecca. I think I, I, I will put the motion together and then I think it's up to each board member to vote their conscience about sort of what do they think they can do. And we may end up saying, you know, that, that we are not in a unanimous place here. I think that's possible. Um, um, all right, not to muck up the... Uh, the works since you've already got this rolling, but I will not be comfortable voting approval for this well until we have rescinded the prior approval. Otherwise, yep. there will be a moment in time where there will be two wells approved. Yep. Uh, no, so so what, let, let me try to sort of put it all together. And then there's one condition, Daryl, I'll ask for your advice on. So what I would propose is that we approve the plan as presented, conditional to either the updating of the plan to reflect a barrier given the present proximity of the driveway to the wellhead or the movement of the driveway. I think it's conditional to final lot lines. Um, and I think it's conditional to uh, Conservation Commission providing final guidance on the SAS. Um, but again, I think that that needs to happen before that can sort of be approved, but it doesn't sound like we expect anything to change. And given that that hearing's tomorrow, um, I think it's reasonable to proceed. But if something changed there, then this would, would sort of not be effective, but I think it's sufficiently unlikely that it's reasonable to move forward. Um, are there any additional conditions or 
edits to the motion that anybody would like to make. Uh, Matt, if I could. Yeah, fire away, Mark. Yeah, under note number 17 of general notes, I had the engineer place the requirement that a deed recording shall be required since they're not designing for a garbage grinder. Okay. I'd Sounds also good. suggest that if they choose to do will protection, that there be a deed recording to alert homeowners that that protection must remain in place and can't be changed without um, coming before the Board of Health. And, right, because that's something people may think, gee, I want to get this rock out of the way. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, I would sort of echo Daryl's point. What I would propose that we do is that as a part of the same motion, we rescind the well permit that was provided in the previous location with the previous lot line that we apply that fee to that well permit to this well permit um, so that we don't sort of have multiple approved wells for the same lot. Mr. Mertens and Mr. Murphy, do you have any concern with that element? The only thing uh, we would, we do have a well driller that is planning, can come this week. And we were hoping that they could actually drill the well this week. And so if that is, uh, possible, then we want to make sure that whatever your vote is tonight, if it is affirmative, that that can happen. And I'm, I, I can't tell from the conditions whether or not that is possible or... I definitely can't promise you that. I, I mean, I think the conditions are sort of what, what get us to yes if anything does. And so I certainly can't promise that those are conditions you'll be able to satisfy in the next 48 hours or that I have no control over what conservation could say tomorrow. Although again, I think it's unlikely to change, particularly the impact on the well. Uh, Matt, Matt, just to be clear, conservation has already approved the well drilling many, many months yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, right. And so again, I think for me, it's a question of if conservation had some unexpected variance with the septic system, that's a piece I don't know today. I think it's vanishingly unlikely or I wouldn't vote on it today. Um, but I, I want to be clear that that is one of the variables that sort of the risk you take as the property owner, you know, is that if there's a wild card there, that sits with you guys, not with us. Um, and so from a, it sounds like there's no concerns from the applicant in terms of the proposed workflow for rescinding the initial well application and rolling that over to this application in combination with the SAS to sort of address Daryl's concern of, we really can't approve two well permits on the same property and be consistent with our regulation. So I think this is the way to get through that tonight. Um, so, so it certainly makes sense to me, but it's your your permit. Oh, well, we certainly think that this approval of this well would supersede and replace the earlier approval. Okay, so uh, what we would then do is, we uh, do I have a motion to, uh, rescind the initial well approval, apply the fee from the initial well to the current application, to approve the current application with the conditions aforementioned as it relates to the setback, or as it relates to the driveway um, and the final determination by conservation commission as it relates to the SAS. Again, recognizing we may not get unanimity on the board, I would still invite board members who may end up at a no to apply any conditions that they think may be appropriate if there are additional that I've missed. I would support that motion. Okay, so I've got- uh, All right, I'm, I'm really, I will, uh, I'm sorry, but I was busy admitting people. So I missed whether is this strictly on rescinding the first well? Uh, so I think I it's a- I think it's a composite motion because I think if I were the applicant, I'd say I, I want this as part of a package. And so I think we should do it as a, a package vote to say rescinding the first yeah, well okay. application as part right. and parcel. Yes, that's what I thought you were saying. I just want yep. to make sure since I was just no, no worries. Next time we and should Ellen, is that out. is does that complicate the process? Because I don't think we've coupled them in this way before. No, I don't think so, because you're okay. receiving the initial well at the same time that you're 
um, approving the the other one. Okay. All right, and I think the other clarification I would make is we are really approving the plan which covers well house and septic. And Mark, I'm presuming that all three of those elements from your review now meet the requirements? As proposed on the plot plan. So as proposed, well location. so we still need the you know, confirmations and we're out of sequence in terms of not having conservation commission approval finalized yet. Um, so presently well location as shown with the driveway being moved, septic location as shown, and the house was decreased in size so the septic system could meet the required uh, long-term acceptance rate. So as shown, I guess I would say as shown. Okay, and depth to groundwater beneath the proposed or potential foundation of the house is okay? Yes, that has been reviewed by the engineer to indicate groundwater is deeper than the two feet below the foundation. That is correct. Okay, so we're, I'd like to see us move back to looking at a lot in its entirety. So that's partly why I raised that issue is to get us aligned and make this easier. All right. Thanks, Daryl. So I think we've got a motion from Matt. Is there a second? Uh, did it include approval of everything? Yeah. Uh, just on the well. Uh, approval of everything con with the condition. Um, okay, with the conditions that we talked about. So I guess I guess the only other condition, um, I would love your help, Daryl, on the, the Conservation Commission language. So I think we're waiting the SAS portion is conditional to Conservation Commission. Like what's their output for tomorrow? Uh, well, it won't be or just presumably. tomorrow. It'll be longer than that. It'll be um, 20 days after whenever they finalize the order of conditions for the property. Okay, so. And it will be for uh, the entirety of the property, although the well has already been approved. So is it fair to say that, that would, the release of the SAS plan would be conditional to, um, what, what was the language? The oh, uh, receipt of the final order of, a, um, order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. And, and that will be following the 20-day appeal period okay. that it needs to remain open for. And so that's a condition for the release of the SAS, but not the well. Yes, and for the house. And for the house, okay. Um, and so Matt, do you feel comfortable making that motion or saying, so moved? Um, yes, so moved. Perfect, do we have a second? I'll give a second. Okay. Uh, Daryl. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Aye. Matt. Aye. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I'm backing yeah. up. I did have okay. another comment. Okay. Uh, now I remember what else I want to ask. I would like a condition to also that we just verify with the town council and the planning board that these lots can be looked at or should be looked at individually or whether they should be looked at in the context of this very interconnected pro overall project. So I think uh, I'm okay with that condition. I think the request I would have is that uh, I would favor still releasing the well plan while that's clarified, because again, I think that's a risk potentially to the applicant, but it's unlikely that the well will be the core issue of that and the, the sort of relevance I think is principally with the septic. Yes. Okay. And so that I would then make that as a condition for the release of the SAS plan would be either a determination by EH by the planning board and town council that this in fact should be considered as part of an environmental the EHIR or that it does not need to be considered or that it may be considered depending on what subsequent things come in. So it'd sort of be based on that outcome in terms of the release. Yes. Okay. All right. 
Um, so, so I guess but, we need another move and second. Yep. I yeah. Think we do. It actually helped me to just just have the motion restated, including all that, because I feel like all we've. Right. All right. I, I think I've got a. I think I've got at least a 50-50. If I miss something, please feel free to chime in. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the plans as listed, conditional to a deed recording reflecting that no garbage grinder may be in place, conditional to either the movement of the driveway or an updating of the plan to reflect the placement of a barrier protecting the wellhead, conditional to um, the receipt of the order of conditions for the release of the SAS uh, from Conservation Condition Commission. And house. Uh, what was that in house um, and conditional to guidance from town council and planning board as to whether this property may be appropriately treated as an isolated parcel or whether it needs to be integrated into a larger proposal and I miss I'm missing one uh, lot lines uh, finalized <laughs> lot lines um, Rescind and apply. Uh, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jim. And so, and rescind the existing well, the previously granted well permit and applying the fee from that to the current application's well permit. Okay. Thank you, Matt. I think that clarifies for me all the relevant pieces. Um, and so I, I will, uh, would support that motion. So moved. Do I have a second? I'm also open to a third. I'll second it. Okay, perfect. Um, Daryl? Aye. Or Daryl, I, I should say. Matt, Matt Beaver's aye. Lisa, I. Rebecca Honeywell, nay. Matt Vitale, aye. Matt. Matt, it's Bob. Could I yep. ask? Could I ask the the board with respect uh, that the person who voted aye to uh, put a reason in the record uh, for voting against this uh, motion? You mean nay? Nay, excuse me. Of course, thank you. Could, could I ask that uh, the I, I, person? I, I don't think. I mean, I don't think that's required. I think if Rebecca would like to, she's certainly welcome to. But I don't think she's required to justify it. Okay, but let, it, let the record show that I have asked that she explain her no vote. Fair, fair enough. We the other last at the last meeting, a well was approved that we already know is going to require a variance. This never should have been authorized, in my opinion. And that's my opinion. To begin with, the first. Uh well should never have been authorized because we know that it's going to require a variance for the uh, uh, a it's it's a variance or a condition rebecca a, a variance is not the same yeah i'm not i'm not aware of any variance it's been asked yeah, for granted it's conditional uh, I, think, but it's I think she may be referring to no, the exception that led to this I, whole mess you are misunderstanding my question and i would like you to i do not want to have a conversation with you right now about okay. it. we have the conversation another time at the time i expressed my objection because i thought it put the neighbor in a position that was going to require a variance if he ever chooses to do anything and i think that's irresponsible of the board and i okay. i maintain that opinion okay so there's sort of rebecca's comment um if there's no further comment from the board i'm mad uh, if i may uh, fire away, Mark. Yeah, no, just since this has been discussed for quite a while and we've had both sides of it, uh, just so the applicant knows, I know the applicant noted he'd like to start drilling the well as soon as possible. I would note that there is a liability to that because there is an appeal section in section 11 of our regulations. So I would refer them to section 11 to be aware of that uh, and that if they do drill and an appeal is submitted, uh, that is at their own risk. That's all I wanted to note. That's section 11, regulation 11 in our regulations. Thank okay. you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. My counsel has advised me the same. So thank you. Okay. Um, and also because of whatever happens with the appeal process for conservation commission as well, or 
appeal period? Uh, uh, Daryl, the appeal period has long passed. The Conservation Commission approved that well back in July. I, I think Daryl's plans for the SAS and the, the matter yes. except tomorrow. So if there, there was, days. we don't know what might happen. I understand it may not result in any changes, but it's still a risk. It and, may and be think, very small, but that's for you to decide. And again, I think it's, Bob, I think we say this not because we expect it to change, but because we want to be transparent, as you say, boy, I'm going to drill. I, I wouldn't want you to come back and say, boy, I drilled and something changed and you guys didn't tell me. So Matt, can I clarify, when will I be able to pick up, do I need a piece of paper to put a drill bit in the ground? And if I do, when can I pick up that piece of paper? Just to be, so we're all very clear. To help the board out with that, I'm out of town until Friday afternoon. I will be okay. able to process that application on Friday afternoon if the board so wishes to have okay. the other staff sign in on my behalf, for the, on behalf of the board, I'm okay with that as well. Okay. Would the board be all right with it being signed and sent by PDF to me by email? It seems in the 21st century, that's a reasonable request. Ellen, what's the process? Standard. Well, that, that's up to the board. I can sign it with your name electronically, but they would need to email me the um, application. I don't have that, the application electronically. Oh, and, uh, and the application transfer the fee over or has, is the fee still outstanding? The, no, this, fee, the fee has been paid and I believe Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe DeShang uh, uh, filed a new application with you many weeks oh, ago. Oh, he may have, yes. Yes, I believe I can, he did. So I believe yeah. you have an, an I, application yeah. and I believe you have the check, yep. you cashed it already. And what I'm asking is, is that it be signed and uh, sent by PDF by yep. email to me. That's up to the board. I can I, sign I would say, I, I, I have no concerns. I think we should I think we can sign and send, and then I would also favor mailing a hard copy as well. I think we also need to vote on transferring the fee. Uh, that was incorporated oh, into part the of that Oh, it was, okay. Yep. Baked in. Right. So we just need to let Ellen sign it, basically. That's the issue, because Mark's away. Well, who, if I'm signing it electronically, just whose name do you want me to put on the permit? Would I put Mark's name? Because he typically signs the well permit. Yeah, I typically sign them on behalf of the board's vote. So that's the standard. And it's unfortunate that I can't do it tomorrow, but I could do it Friday afternoon. So Okay, that's not long to wait. I believe the driller was coming next week. Have we ever done it where Mark did not sign? I would say I'm not, a, like if Mark is signing on behalf of the board, like I'm not super attached to who signs it. And I think it's reasonable for us to say, you know, here's the signing process and to distribute it particularly if Mark is acting on our behalf, like. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'm not gonna hold it to Mark having to be the one that signs on our behalf. Yeah. The decision's um, good. And so I'm certainly, again, like if this is on behalf of the board, I'm certainly happy. Uh, I'm not sure who's in the office tomorrow. I'm happy to come by to sign or, you know, whatever we kind of need to do to get the sign and shared with the applicant, I think would be fine if it's sort of reflecting the action of the board. Well, if he's requesting an electronic, can I just sign Mark's name electronically? I've got no concerns with that. Mark, is that comfortable for you? I'm okay with that as well. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, with that, we'll close this episode of um, Farm Road. Thank you very much. So I will I will do that tomorrow and then I will send it to Mr. Murchison by email. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Ellen. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Yep. Um, Daryl, can you pull up the agenda for us and I will pass the baton and glory back to you. And I've got to step out for like two seconds. All right, I think this might be an excellent time to talk about the process for approvals and out of sequence approvals.
So I don't know. Well, except it'd be nice. I, to I would, I would like honestly present. say, like, I would say, like, after spending an hour and a half on it, I would love to do a different topic, even if we still tackle this tonight, because I'm just okay. exhausted. Yes. All right. So um, maybe could we tackle the public health nurse position first? Yes. Okay. So the public health nurse position is something that uh, an idea that was raised by Ellen as an option for using ARPA funds, which are explicitly supposed to be for public health initiatives uh, and related, which has included uh, water supply and, and septic management as well for various towns. But um, sorry, I was distracted by, <laughs> by something. So I'll just try to the again advantage of having a part-time public health nurse would be that we do already employ public health nurses. We use um, contractors for that and they do a wonderful job. But if we had a part-time person for town, there would be other duties that we could offload to them because really the, the burden, the time burdens are very high on staff right now. And one of the other things that the public health nurse could take on would be emergency management and the procedures around that for the town and keeping that up to date, because that is a big job. And that is uh, something that is used across multiple departments, certainly DPW, police, fire, board of health and others would be involved with emergency management. So it's something that would serve all. Again, we've uh, already had feedback from consultants who are involved or other people involved with the ARPA process. And they do believe that that would qualify as something that we could do uh, with the funds. And let's see, this in a way ties into that issue though that was added to the agenda this evening, having to do with the shared public health services. And there is a new set of grants coming out uh, and proposals are being sought from consortiums of towns. They want at least six towns in a group. We've been approached by MAHB to group us with other similar towns such as maybe, and none of this is finalized, but um, Millis, Medway, Holliston, maybe Ashland, uh, they're going to look at what groupings make sense based on what the needs are of various towns. That would be funded by the state. And then it's nothing that we have to pay into because we've looked at shared services in the past, but it didn't appear that there was much benefit and it was very hard to figure out how we would, how one would divide up costs among the various towns. But this would be something that would be set up likely elsewhere by a larger town that also had facilities to house. There's a benefit to those towns who do take that on because they get some administrative overhead funds for that. Uh, we don't really have excess space in our municipal building. So it'd be very difficult for us for Sherborne to do that. So in any case, if that gets set up, it would be something that we could potentially avail ourselves of when needed. It's important to note that those, uh, the grant monies that would be provided for that cannot replace existing staff. It has to be for new expanded services. So uh, that also means that we couldn't just cancel our contract with the public health nurse, nurses that we use now and use the um, shared public health nurse if that's one of the staff that's hired through this uh, grant monies. So I think that means that this would not negate this idea, that other possibility does not negate the idea of seeking a part-time public health nurse position using ARPA funds 
to help offload some of the um, excess duties that Ellen has. And again, even though our public health nurses have been wonderful to bring it in house and, and have just in general extra support. So uh, I guess there are a couple of questions. How does the board feel about that? And is anyone interested in helping to craft whatever we would pitch to, to apply for the ARPA funds? Wait, Daryl, can you just repeat? Sorry, I guess I'm tired. Um, but yeah, can, can you just <laughs> clarify again? So, are you saying that we can't use this to fund something that we currently might be outsourcing, or we? Oh can't? no, uh, I think sorry. It, it, I, think I was mixing up can, the two. Oh. I think it's that we can't use it to replace something we already do. It's got to be new stuff. And I no, think no, that, that's yeah. oh. sorry. I didn't explain it well enough. I started mixing the two issues. One okay, is yeah. this part time public health nurse position that we can use ARPA funds for. It doesn't have to be brand new. Okay, so we could use that in lieu of having to continue outsourcing to like a part-time VNA at a higher rate? Um, we, who knows what the rate will be, can't guarantee yeah. what it will be, uh, but it will help. I think it'll give us It'll more help effective. provide more. Uh, it's very hard to keep emergency plans up to date and everyone in line with that. And that's difficult to manage. So this would be a great thing to have someone who could focus more attention on it. The thing that you can't replace existing services is that separate program coming from the new grants that will be coming out from the state uh, to help fund shared services across municipalities. So that um, it's hard to say exactly where that's going because that just came up so we don't have to decide on that tonight other than to give some sense to them as to whether we would be willing to be listed in a group of like towns. And what I would love to see, but I don't know if it would quite work out, is uh, added support for regulatory enhancements since that's part of what we've been talking about tonight is how difficult it is to capture all these details in regulations and new circumstances, new pressure on lands, new technologies for using land. Um, so so that would be part of that, this joint shared resource? Uh, that's, that would be on my wish list for that is someone okay. to help us out with regulatory okay. revisions. I think it got confusing because it almost seemed like we were yes. conflating both of these. So. Should, should, let's keep them discreet if they're discreet. Yes. Okay, yes. thanks. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sorry. I'm also tired. <laughs> so, all right. So, back to uh, is there support for pursuing a new part time public health nurse position? And does anybody want to work on that? If I work on it, just there has to be some write-up that goes into um, finance and advisory and whoever I, else reviews it. I, I would say I've been uh, super satisfied with Walpole VNA and I think they've delivered really exceptional service. I do think there's a benefit to saying, you know, somebody works for us and we have a little bit more flexibility over the roles. While I also think Walpole VNA has been just wonderful um, mm -hmm. So I would be supportive. I, I'm happy to collaborate. I think I probably have some knowledge gaps around the ARPA piece, but I'm happy to think through some of the use cases and to help work on that language. And so I'm happy, Ellen, I, I may try to pull you in a little bit in terms of helping think through some of the things that have been on your kind of wish list in your role, because I suspect you've got more insights into that than I do, but I'm happy to, to kind of be the person responsible for helping draft language and, and kind of start on version one of that. Okay, and it could also be that, I mean, it depends on what people are available out there too. Maybe there's somebody who only wants to work on emergency management or flu clinics. That's the other duty that could be offloaded from Ellen and Jean is to have folks who are trained in the new color 
software, color is the brand name of the software, that so, so is going to have to be used for future flu clinics. So there are other advantages, but yes, if there's anyone, uh, okay, so Matt, you're possibly I, I'm, I'm signing up. Um, okay. Although, Hi. Ellen, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask a question. Like we were discussing last time with the um, ready availability of you know, CVS, Walgreens, and the amount of time it takes for Ellen and others to coordinate flu clinics, you know, for a town of our size, does it make sense for us to continue doing that with the exception of providing like homebound, you know, person, you know, persons in the town vaccinations that could maybe, you know, people could go to their house if they're, you know, unable mm -hmm. um, to do it. But I, I guess I'm just wondering, it seems like it takes a lot of time. We've had declining numbers. There's, you know, within five miles, there's numerous locations that provide, you know, the same kind of service. Um, is that something that we should continue dedicating time and resources to? Uh, my personal opinion is I don't think we should. Me too. Because I do think there are so many options <laughs> yeah, for I agree. people to find it elsewhere. And I don't think we have, and I can't say no, but I don't think we have a sizable population. Or if we do have a population that has trouble getting vaccines, then it'd be nice to know that that is truly a problem. But a lot of these programs are done in municipalities where there are people with no insurance and no primary care physician. So yeah. it's it's just a different situation than Sherborne. I, I just want I'm I also agree. However, if um, the board chooses to continue with the emergency preparedness program. Be, and have Sherburn be a part of Region 4AB, one of the requirements, one of the deliverables is to have um, actual physical drills and the flu clinic satisfies that requirement, no matter how big or how large or oh. how small the flu clinic is, that satisfies that requirement that deliverable. Um, for the and otherwise we'd have to fabricate an event that would right. take as much time. Exactly. And oh, then, okay, uh, I, that wasn't clear to me. But uh oh, I, yeah, I didn't know that either. So, so that mm. is why my suggestion of the- Yeah. You, so let's do this. Let's... A, pub, a public health nurse, that that public health nurse could and handle that. Yeah. Right. Oh, and that we could sense. also limit it to just the high dose, say, for example, for seniors, perhaps. Right. I, I think okay. thinking about ways to narrow the scope, because I do think there's ready access. Um, mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. So Ellen, are you okay kind of working on that with me and, and we can bring something either to the next November meeting or the first December meeting? Yeah. yeah. Perfect, okay. Yeah, how about, why don't, uh, well, not the next meeting, no, maybe the 17th, I, the regular. I, I, and I think more likely the first meeting in December, just sort of looking yep. at the, the, the task to achieve um, with what we've got on the docket. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that sounds good. All right, let's, okay. so it All sounds right. like, do we want to go back to the out-of-sequence approvals, the process for approvals and out-of-sequence Oh, approvals? just a couple, oh, let's just wrap up MAHB items. So ah, perfect. Okay. shall I indicate that Sherborne is interested in teaming with other towns? And again, it sounds like there's no financial commitment needed from us because it's going to be funded by the state. I like and something that no financial set up. commitment. Yeah, and I, th I think the regulatory enhancements, because I think a lot of towns are dealing with similar issues relative to mm -hmm you know, development and, you know, multiple tenant septic issues and, you know, um, COVID, uh, other items that I think, you know, we could certainly uh, have strength in, uh, in numbers and, you know, mm -hmm. use shared resources. So I think that that makes sense 
to me. Okay, so do we have, I'm gonna ask for a vote just so if I contact them, it's official. Uh, do we have a motion to authorize me to let the MAHB know that Sherborne is interested in participating in the grant, the new Metro West? Um, Ellen, sorry, I forgot again the specific terminology. Uh, enhancement of yes, the public health public, shared public, services. <laughs> public health excellence for shared services grant program. Okay, that. I moved. Second. <laughs> Other comments? Daryl, aye. Matt Beavers, aye. Lisa, aye. Rebecca Honeywell, aye. Matt Vitae, aye. Okay, and the other one is the MAHB proposed op-ed letter that has gone in. They couldn't wait for our meeting because uh, they want to get into the, um, submit to the newspaper yesterday morning, I believe. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little moot, but they would like to know if we support in general. And I, thought that the letter raised some interesting issues. I proposed um, an edit to it that I don't know. I don't think it went into the first version. And hold on a second, I'll tell you roughly what I said. Uh, I just wanted to see something that indicated that not all of the signatories have experienced each of the issues raised in this letter. However, all have felt the strain of the pandemic in one way or another and all are concerned about the overall status or robustness or resilience of public health functions in Massachusetts as highlighted by the last couple of years. And I was concerned about that because when it talked about small towns and then an issue that small towns have trouble with, I didn't feel at Sherborne as one of the small town signatories that that exactly aligned with us. So that's why I had that qualifier. Um, but the other issue is that I did not want to sign the letter on behalf of Sherborne without the full board's approval. So, uh, so then the question would be, do we want to support it in principle? And if so, then I could just relay that we would support it if they're ever going to put another uh, letter into the newspaper or deliver that letter to the legislature, which is who I think they might ultimately send information to as well. So would would anyone be interested in uh, making a motion to authorize me to let the MAHB know that we support their their issues letter uh, with or without that addition? I, I like it with the addition. Like I think you know that sort of lines up, but so moved. Uh, second, and I think it's especially pertinent in light of some of the uh, litigious actions that are going on against individual boards of health that just sort of emphasizes this point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if there are no other comments, Daryl, aye. Matt Beavers, aye. Lisa, aye. Rebecca, I think you're up. Not hearing you. Rebecca, me. are you still here? Not hearing Rebecca, Matt Vitale, aye. Okay. All right. Uh, do we only have one issue left? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one. So I'd like to say our normal process for reviewing um, a site plan for a new property is usually that once everything is completed, including Conservation Commission approval, then Marks reviews everything and typically comes to a meeting with a plan that doesn't require variances and says to us, He'll describe some of the 
important features of the property, if there are any that are maybe a little different than normal. And he'll recommend approval. And we might ask some questions. And it, the whole process, at least in our meetings, takes about five minutes. Uh, and so one is that just seems to go much more smoothly uh, than when we don't go in order. And we also had some issues where uh, we, we relied on information without having had the, ch at a meeting, without having had the chance to verify some things ourselves, such as what exactly in this recent case planning board um, review, approval, endorsement meant. And that just made everything get complicated. And we do have a timeline too of what went on for this recent most um, difficult path to approvals. And a lot of it really does hinge on whether we have complete information when we're going in to look at something or not. And we have definitions of what constitutes something being complete. And that has evolved over many years because in the past people could see that when, when something wasn't complete and you're trying to make decisions on it or when things are still in flux and changing, a lot more time is spent, there's a lot more confusion. It was a, the folks in the past felt it was a better service to the applicants to have something that went in a nice orderly stepwise fashion so that each subsequent step built upon the prior steps. Or, or Daryl. I just don't could, want to do this again. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a sequencing question, but I also think there's or, you know, if it's for, for situations like, for example, some of the things we discussed tonight, where there is a building permit application, where there is a new septic and a new well, that, you know, everything be looked at in totality versus a piece at a time so that, you know, we can look at multiple factors and lines of evidence simultaneously versus in an you know partitioned fashion and also that if there's any pending um you know permits or anything for many abutters that you know that 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 needs to be you know considered in conjunction as well and that if there's multi developments of contiguous lots by a single developer um or single owner that that be considered a project and that it again not be looked at in as separate and distinct projects but if it's a single developer or owner with multiple contiguous lot development that that be considered in totality versus in a you know piecemeal fashion mm -hmm. and when we wrote I was gonna say, sorry. fairly recently we very explicitly talked about writing it because we did not want uh, site development to be artificially divided up right. in order to fall below the threshold. So that was exact. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about that and how to express it here. So that was, uh, per your last point, that was absolutely what we were after. And that's consistent with what is done at other levels of regulation, certainly EPCRA, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Um, right. Use but, things that way as well. So I think, that, oh, go ahead, I totally, go ahead. yeah, totally agree with that concept. I think that, you know, we're gonna have to be very, if we sort of want to change that going forward, we have to be very careful about how timing plays into that, right? Because I think that's part of what we're seeing here is that Clearly, if everything was presented at once, it would fall under this, but the sort of piecemeal presentation, like 
And like, how do we sort of do that in a reasonable way where we can say, oh, well, we know you own all these other things. So like, you have to develop it. You have to tell us um, versus like, you know, do we say you're prohibited from developing another portion for some time? I, I just think it becomes complicated and, and I don't have an answer, yes. but I think we need to think about it. Yes. All right. Yeah. I think that's why I'm saying like having an integrated project plan, if there's going to be. Right. But I guess what defines a project? Like if I own, if I own 10 parcels that I'm developing two of them now, do I have to propose to develop them all now? Or do I have to, or do I like, if I do, we're going to develop the other ones five years from now, how does that fall in? And so I think, I think that's yeah. where, where we can, I think that's what sort of allowed this to slip through is that it's being presented piecemeal. And so how do we, how do we avoid something from being presented piecemeal? Because well, I think at the same time, you can't just say, well, if you own multiple properties automatically, it's a project. Well, I think if it's contiguous properties, so that, you know, things that setbacks and adequacy of aquifer supply um, and quality, I mean, that's, you know, like, for example, some of the larger developments that we've seen, it's, they don't put up all of those houses at the same time, but they right. talk about, here's what we're going to do. So right. we can sort of see the compounded impact. And that's what I'm so, getting. At. It doesn't so I guess my question is, are we going to require someone to present? Like, how do we do that? Right. How do we, I, think, I mean, we, we could, we, this, this would, oh, no, but do, we, do we say that like, if you own 10 properties, you must show a plan for developing all of them. Like, I think I think that that's something even if even if you don't intend to like like that that's what I'm saying like I'm just trying to close the loophole because it's easy for me right. to say I own ten properties but I'm only going to build on this one so I'm presenting it now right that's why I'm saying that I think if if the intent is to um, develop you know within I mean maybe we could put a time limit on it you know within yeah I, I guess that's what I'm saying because it's easy enough to say well my intent is only develop on this one. And the next year I come back and say, well, I changed my mind. I'm going to develop on this one. Right, exactly. Like, how do we, exactly. how do we close that loophole is, is the question. Because I think you can't tell people they have to develop. No, 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 no. Time, I, yeah. mean, I think, You I can't think. say that you can't develop only one of your properties, right? Right. No, so, I think that, that, that owners of property certainly have rights. But at the same time, we want to have an integrated plan so that we're not going to be causing a trickle down effect and repercussion. I, I, totally, a... I totally agree with you. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand how we enforce. Right. Like, well, I, 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 this is very like, premature, Matt, though. Like we're yeah. getting too granular here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, all I wanted to say was we need to think about that because there's a, yeah. I think there's, I see a big loophole happening there. So, yeah. so can, I, can I ask a, a framing question? Like, I think there's two parts, right? Like, I think one is that you know, we certainly may have a bylaw revision that's appropriate. I think the other piece is that, you know, in terms of formalizing things that are not multi-property developments, but just the sequence you described, Daryl, like independent of anything that we've talked about in the last two months, like I do think the process matters. I do think that there's a consistent way that the board has applied it. I do think it makes sense to make it so that that is identifiable by an individual homeowner. One thought I have is that I think we have various flow sheets that provide and communicate sequences clearly. And I know, you know, as I started trying to think about this topic a little bit, like there's the permitting procedures manual circa 2004, you know, that again outlines part of this and, you know, mm -hmm. that feels outdated, but at the same time, like that's still the process and flow chart that we communicate to homeowners who are changing the footprint of their home. And I do think updating that to reflect the longstanding practice of the board in terms of the sequencing and completeness, independent from any valid questions about subdivided properties or larger scale projects, but just to kind of say, hey, if this is what the practice is and this is what the rules are in the age of the internet, how can we help make that more transparent, clear, and sort of available yes. to people? And, and that feels like something we could do now while also pursuing a bylaw re revision if this process has identified gaps in our regulations that feel important to address. Yep. And I mean, I, even on a single parcel though, if it's, uh, I'm talking about new development, even on a single parcel, I would feel much more comfortable um, even on a single parcel of development if we had a clear sense of the building, um, you know, size, number of bedrooms, and the septic proposal and location, and the well proposal and location. Hundred percent at the same time. Yeah, yep. so, so I, I, I think that's an easier problem to solve. Yeah, yep. and I, I mean, so so that's something that I think we could just say, 
you know, approvals are have to be put forth, um, you know, at, at in an integrated fashion, um, and that we're not going to do some, you know, a well first, and then five months later, a septic, and then five months later, an understanding of the building. Like, I think that it's perfectly fair to us to say, you need to be mindful of designing all these things, you know, contingent upon all of our regulations and setbacks. So we need to understand the whole picture at the same time. And Mark, could you just, or Ellen, how many are, can you say anything about how often we get uh, site plans for a new property that the well and house and septic are not combined? I on can't the one remember plan. one ever from my time here. It's okay. the first I've seen it. Uh, okay. Ellen, you can comment if you'd like, but that's it's one of the first. It's the first I can remember. Yeah, I I agree. They they always come in. So this more. isn't a this wouldn't be a hardship. So it, so we no. should put it in writing. No. Okay. And, and, and I, I'd I, also like us to be mindful too of what it means to have a complete application, which is a standard process for across Mass DEP on lots of things and for lots of towns. Um, because it's the completeness. It isn't the first version of something that has lots of deficiencies. That doesn't start the clock. It's, it's when things are complete. So we just have to be mindful of that and not uh, feel rushed. And, and Daryl, what I what I propose is again. I think all of these are essentially established. Yeah. The established process. I, I forwarded the procedure manual to Ellen, and Ellen will ask you to just distribute to the board. You know, again, I think for me this isn't a you know the the kind of clarifying and making sure what's complete is something that is not a bylaw issue. I think it's uh, you know it really is that procedure issue to say you know, these are what the expectations are. Um, you know, this is what the process is. And I think that would be probably the venue to update it because again, I think that the mm -hmm. bylaws say complete, you know, that's a definition that the board gets to arrive at it, you know, sort of in its own context, but the degree to which we can say, this is what is complete to us, I think leaves an applicant best equipped to be able to kind of mm -hmm. get things together and be successful in their application. Yep, I like that idea. Um, so what, what I might suggest is, uh, I asked Ellen, so I forwarded the document to Ellen to circulate, and I sort of, I wonder if it might be reasonable to take for either, uh, I think we can't have more than two, but if two people want to take a stab at V1 and V2, and then share that either at the next meeting or the December 3rd meeting in terms of tackling the procedures. And then it, I do think there's valid bylaw questions that, that kind of are coming up and are also valid but I might suggest that we focus on updating the procedure manual, making sure that that's as clear to end users mm -hmm. as it can be. Uh, and then, you know, figure out what gaps remain after that uh, in terms of things that are not issues of clarity, but are, in, are issues of rule um, and to provide those. Um, well, yeah. and I'll also mention that before COVID hit, we were actually about to uh, look into hiring a consultant who could help with regulatory updates. So maybe that needs to be revisited again. Can I, can I just comment? I, I yep. just want to let you know on that this permitting procedure manual that is um, was done by Gino, the town planner, and that is his document. I don't know if you know the board should probably work with him to update it. Perfect. So may, maybe we could come up with like a V1 and then to say, you know, Gino, this is sort of how we see it. Because I think, again, it's on the town's website about this is what, how the process works and what the next steps are. And I think, you know, I would imagine. Yeah, it's on the planning board website. Uh, I, I found it, uh, I found it as a link under the building department. Um, but I, I don't disagree that it's a planning board, but I just think like, I think the average homeowner could say, hey, this looks like a resource. I'm totally happy to say, you know, this is Gino's document and he owns it, but I would 
ask that Gino's document reflects our process. And I think it might make sense for us to come up with, you know, if there's updated language we'd recommend be included, that we put that together. And then as we reach consensus to bring that back to Gino. Does that seem reasonable, Ellen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, I uh, have already volunteered for the very glamorous job of uh, public <laughs> health nurse. So I'm going to ask others to, to sort of say who's willing for a kind of V1 and who's willing for a second set of eyes. And then let's plan to have this on the agenda for the first meeting in December. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which is playing in my head, whether it's crickets or sound of silence, but it's definitely <laughs> possibly some bizarre compilation. It's super, super indie. Um, I, I, if I get uh, to work with Ellen, uh, maybe I would. I, I, I'm um, happy but to, I can't do it right away. I don't no, know no, I think that, like, I, I don't, I think December. this is, I think this is an important issue. I'm happy to, to collaborate on it as well. Um, I think I probably have some content knowledge gaps that I'm happy to sort of turn to Ellen and Mark for, and then maybe Daryl, I can get your feedback and we can bring it back to the full board on the, on the first December meeting. I mean, I'd also say I'm happy to be a second set of eyes, but I feel like with, so the, maybe, least, with the least experience, I'm not sure I should do the, uh, with sort of our history here, I don't know if I should do the first draft on this one, um, a little outside my area. I think that, so why, why don't we do this? Um, why don't we have this be team mad to take a look at it, but we'll recognize that the December meeting will be a, a very rough draft and that Ellen and Mark can expect to hear from us on the topics to just make sure we're sort of getting it right and getting some of the language right. But I, I'm happy to put together an overly verbose V1 that Matt can then make into a much more succinct V2. You can, yes, yeah, the straw, the straw man or straw person. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, actually the first draft is always the hardest. Yeah. I can make it long. I just can't make it good. But no, we, but and long is it. long it's is easier better to because... cut. Easier to cut. Yep. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so Matt, if that's okay with you, I'm, you know, we can yeah. kind of tackle that. Mark and Ellen will reach out for some of your subject matter expertise. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Perfect. So, um, it's agreed. I don't even know if we need a motion because it'll just be going back to what we used to do. I, stick to our sequence yeah and what i would say is i think let's let's i, I don't think there's a motion because i think it's adhering to our historical yeah. process and i would say and we tried something different and that was tough i i want to keep it separate from any specific project but yeah. i do think like yeah. i think it highlighted that having clarity um and clarification yep yeah and, and just having tools to help develop a shared understanding is really helpful so we'll work on that and we'll revisit on that december meeting Sounds good. All right. All right. Um, so I think the other item we have is the oh, two minutes for approval. I sent Ellen some minor edits. I think at one point that the oak was just the maple was described as 11 feet, which I think is more sizable than the train question. But that was the scale of my edits was trivial. OK, uh, and I also sent in just some minor edits, you know, a few tweaks based on reviewing the uh, recording. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they look great. All right, so do we have a motion to approve the amended minute, minutes of 10, 20, 20, 21? So moved. Seconded. Daryl, aye. Matt Beavers, aye. Rebecca Honeywell, aye. Mavitai, aye. Okay. And then agenda items for upcoming meetings. We've already talked about the 1110 yep. uh, earlier. And I think we'll have some of the usual things COVID 19 update. Um, I, I mean, don't know what else yet. I, I think we can have a tentative line item. Again, I, I think we don't know what the data will show, but you know, I, I think having the line item for COVID masking is, or COVID data as it relates to municipal masking will remain mm -hmm. relevant with whatever we land on, on the 10th. Okay. 
And then I think other things we can just see how it goes, whether we're discussing the public health nurse or the uh, new procedure, uh, not new procedures, but new document about procedures. Okay. I think that I think the procedure document update will probably be the uh, the December third meeting, not the November seventeenth meeting. Yeah. Okay. True. That's right. Um, perfect. All right. Do we I want think to vote? That's it. I think that's so, it. So, all right. Do we have? Yeah, Daryl, I'm trying to remember what. Yeah. Daryl, what what was the agenda item we added? It was that. Um, the, the grant. Perfect. The grant okay. monies. Yep. yep. Just thank, the one. Thank you. Sorry for All the right. pop quiz. So do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. With deep and abiding enthusiasm. Second. <laughs> Daryl I. Matt Beavers I. Lisa I. Rebecca Honeywell I. Matt Vitale I. Have a good night, guys. Excellent. Good night, good night everyone. everyone. Good night.